And today it's Revival Fires, Praise and Worship. Praise and Worship. Go to Psalm 149. Psalm 149. This particular psalm is nine verses. And there's a dynamic of worship that we have to embrace as, as, uh, as the people of God and as saints. David was a worshiper, but he was also a warrior. And we have to understand that as the Christians that are upon the face of this earth and that God has drawn to himself placed the divine nature within us, breathed into his, his, us his spirit, and has given us a mandate into the world, uh, it, it's important that we realize that there is a warfare aspect to it, and there is a worship aspect to it. David was a worshiper, but he was also a warrior. He becomes such a great pattern of what this looks like for even the New Testament church, although we don't fight the same way that he fought, and we're going to deal with that here. But we have to understand that your worship is also a weapon. Can I have an amen, y'all? That your worship is a weapon. That your worship strikes. It delivers a blow. It pushes back. It tears down. It begins to rebuke things and knock stuff off of you. When you're dealing with depression and discouragement, learn how to use the weapon of war that God has given you. That is the, the, the weapon of praise and worship. And this is, how, and this is what we do. We enter into a dynamic where we, real, we realize that and it becomes something that we practice. It's not just something here in our, in our mind. It's something that we practice. and We learn how to push back against the enemy. And so here in Psalm 149, it says here, it says, Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the assembly of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name with the dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel or the tambourine and the harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their bed. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. I want to be a worshiper, but I want to be a warrior. He says, to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all the saints. We're going to get into that. This is going to be good. He says, praise the Lord. This particular Hebrew word, I just talked about it um, and just gave you a brief picture of this word and its definition. It is a verb. This word praise, halal, is a verb meaning to praise, to commend, to boast. When it comes to God, we have to learn how to boast about God. We talk so much about our problems, about our issues, about everything that's going on. We do not take time enough to boast enough about God, who he is in our midst. It means to shine. It means to shine the light on something and to make it bright and brilliant. The root meaning may be to shine, but could also be to shout. This is one of the things that the devil does is he wants you to shut your mouth. He wants to, to silence you, to get you to shut up about who God is. But it is good to boast about God. Don't you let the devil clam you up about who God is in your life. Can I have an amen, y'all? We have to learn that this is part of who we are, and there's a releasing. There's a letting go. There's a breaking, and there's a, there's a shifting in your spirit where you learn how to just begin to praise God, and you're not consumed with the opinion of man. 
but your, the praises of God just begin to overtake you and his goodness and who he is and what he's done and what he's doing and what he's revealed concerning you becomes such a reality that you can't shut your mouth about it. Can I have an amen, y'all? It's something, he, and there's something that we have to realize. This particular Hebrew word the word most often means to praise and is associated with the ministry of the Levites who praise God morning and, eve and evening. And so this is something that God likes. He love it, loves it when we praise him, when we glorify him, when we shout, when we make our boast in him. And it's not that he needs it. He's already God all by himself. But there's something in you that begins to shift and change when you begin to acknowledge who he is in your life. When we get our eyes off of ourselves and our circumstances and begin to place them upon him, he lifts us up out of it. Can I have an amen, y'all? He begins to lift us up out of all the stuff that were the depression and the discouragement. It begins to lift us up out of it. He begins to pull us out when we begin to acknowledge him. It says here, I like this, all creation, however, is urged to join in. He said, if you don't praise him, the rocks will cry out. He says, and various instruments were used to increase the praise to God. The word hallelujah is a command to praise. It is a command to praise. To command to praise Yah, the Lord, derived from the word halal. Now, this, I love this, the reflective form of the verb is often used to signify boasting, 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 that man, God is awesome, man. Man, he is not a man that he should lie, but the son of a man that he should ever have to repent. God is so awesome. He created everything. He fashioned the moon, carved out the mountains and the seas. He's declared the planets and put them in their place. He fixed them. If the sun were to move 10 feet closer to us, we would all disintegrate and die and burn up, but yet it's fixed in its place because God said, stay here. <laughs> <laughs> the waves and the seas and the oceans have been given a command not to go beyond this line. You think about all of the animals and the creation and all the things that God has done, the way in which he's fashioned and formed and created us and all the details. He said, I think I want this one to be a little darker. I think I'd want this one to be a little lighter. I, I'm going to give this one green eyes. I'm going to give this one brown eyes. And I'm going I'm to give this one. Uh, and the way that God just creates. And then, and then we have the nerve to say that we come from apes <laughs> or some big bang. No, we got a big God yeah. who spoke all things into existence. And all things are upheld by the word of his power. God is awesome, man. And, and we, we got to learn, we start to boast about God, brag about God, begin to tell people about God, and begin to acknowledge that. And you know what happens? You know what really happens in the spirit when we begin to boast? The devil just gets angrier and angrier. It makes him mad when you, despite your circumstances or situation or what happened in your life, who was there, who wasn't there, who did this, who did that, the mistakes you make, the good things you did, no matter, when you don't let any of that get in the way and you still yet praise God for who he is in your life, the devil sits back and says, I, I don't know what to do with that. Because though he slay them, yet will they trust him. What happens is something happens when in the spirit that pushes back and it creates, an, it creates an atmosphere around you and your life when you, regardless, you, you just, you're going to praise God. You're going to give God the glory. You're going to boast about God. Something gets seated in your spirit and then, and then a grace is released towards you because you're not following God for the fishes and the loaves. You just want to be around him. And so he says this in verse 1. 
He says, praise the Lord. He says, praise the Lord. And that is the, the Hebrew word halal. He says, sing to the Lord. He says, a new song. This word here, new, means a fresh song. It says, and I like this, it says, and to come to a new spirit that God implants within. So what happens is, is that new songs come as a result of the spirit of God that has been released in you, and he's the one who brings inspiration for the new song. The new song or fresh song comes as a result of him who is the great inspirer. He begins to inspire you from within. It's the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And he begins to birth and release a song in you that is new, that is fresh. And if we're going to be a church that is prophetic, we want to constantly, we want to enjoy the old because we, those have been inspired and we thank God for the old, but we also have to make our spirit available for that which is new. Whether that's from a congregational standpoint or whether that's you singing in your shower. You walk in your dog. You out doing the lawn. You doing the groceries. And then out of yourself, out of your spirit in the grocery store, you just begin to sing out of your spirit that God is good. And, he, and then something just starts to bubble up. That's a fresh song. That's a new song. That's what something. Now, the blessing about being here in the congregation is we have individuals and, and just us here, we, we, we get in. We have those moments even within our service where prophetically God just begins to release and we'll start going to a chant about something and it's just a blessing. God is just inspiring it. But you have to see that no matter how bad you sing, you still can get a new song. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to put you on the worship team. So don't even think about it, Minister Catherine. Ah. Ah. But... (laughs) <laughs> but it does mean that, that God is, he is doing something in us so that people, and, and we have to see that, that man, I have a song that God has placed in my spirit and in my soul. It's a new song concerning my salvation, concerning who he is and, and how he's blessed me. That's something God wants us to to constantly be aware of and conscious of, and then understand that in having that song, it's also a weapon. It's also a weapon. It's also a weapon. He says, sing to the Lord. He says, a new or a fresh, something that has been that has come about because the spirit of God has, has impacted your spirit and now is releasing something out of you. Out of your belly begins to flow a river of living water. He says, sing to the Lord a new song. He says, and his praise in the assembly of the saints. Then this is one of the things that is so important. You know, the the Bible tells us to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. If possible, we need to gather. Something synergistic begins to take place when we gather as the people of God and the power of God and the spirit of God in you and the spirit of God in me and then the anointing and the grace that's upon you and when our gifts and talents and abilities and the anointing and grace begins to come, there's a combustion that takes place. Can I have an amen? As something dynamic begins to release, when you see your brothers and sisters in Christ praising God, it it starts to stir something up in your spirit. But the devil wants us to stay away from each other. But in the assembly of the saints, when we gather together and assemble, something is triggered and something's released. And so what happens is one will put a thousand to flight, two will put ten thousand to fight. What happens is we're able to push back more when we're working together as one. And so that's one of the things that I see even as we're coming out of the pandemic, we got to get back into that mode because God's trying to gather us that he might push back and revival is stirring in the atmosphere. The churches who receive it, the spirit of God is being poured out. Now I'm not saying that God's not at your house. What I am saying, there is a difference. 
that we cannot deny as the assembled company of people and we want to embrace, can I have an amen? Something happens in the spirit. And so we want to have a balance with that, realizing that, uh, that something beautiful begins to take place when we come together. He says here, he says in praise, verse 1, and praise his name in the assembly of the saints. Look at verse 2, let Israel rejoice in their maker. Now, I wrote this down because this is important. For us as saints, we want to make sure that we're rejoicing in our maker, in our maker. He's the one who makes us. I want to rejoice in my creator, in my maker. Now, making me isn't just who I am, but it's who he's making me. Think about it. Not just who I am now, but who he's making me. That I am his worksmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God's prepared beforehand that I should work. So I'm on the potter's wheel, and God is perfecting me. Can I have an amen? He's perfecting me, and I want to rejoice in my maker. I want to rejoice in my maker, realizing that I don't make myself. It's my maker who's making me. My job isn't to make myself my job. Now watch this. My job is to yield in the midst of the process. <laughs> See, because some of us, we start acting like, like Jacob and we want to wrestle with God. We wrestle. We're trying to wrestle. And, and he's trying to change our name. He doesn't want us to be trickster anymore. He doesn't want us to be a fool. He doesn't want us to, to act a fool. He doesn't, he's, he's our maker, and he's trying to make us, and my job is to yield, to yield to the process. And so, because I don't want God to mess around and have to, have to, have to strike my hip. I don't want my, my hip out of socket because I'm trying to wrestle with God. Can I have an Amen. I want to be able to, I don't want to have to walk with a limp for the rest of my life. Now, some of y'all in the room, you say, "Why well, he already got me, Pastor. <laughs> he already got me. I'm limping. Well, I'm just saying, so, so let us learn from you and make sure that we don't like, I want to learn. Lord, I don't want to. Now, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I want to learn from not only people's successes, but also defeats. But then in the midst of it, I'm also learning that even if God did have to sh uh, shake your hip up, look at God. He's still with you. He's still walking with you. He didn't give up on you. He's, you you're still in the fight. Let's, let's continue to, can I have an amen, y'all? But we got to see that he's my maker. The quicker I yield, the quicker the process takes place of him making me who he wants me to be. Well, I want to rejoice in my maker. And we want to have an atmosphere here at the church where we're constantly rejoicing in our maker. The things that he's doing just to promote us and to prepare us, and even those painful moments that God had to use to get our attention. I still praise you, Lord. You had to break me down, but I still thank you, God. You had to put me on the shelf for a while, but God, I thank you that you're still in my life and you're still making me. We've learned how to praise God no matter what happens, and we rejoice in our maker. He says not only rejoice, but saints, look at this. He says, let the children, he says, let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. So I don't want to just, I want to rejoice, but I also want to have this seat of joy that is that rests on the inside of me joy i want it to be seated within my spirit and i want to have a joy in my life and this is one of the things saints stop trying to be so deep that you drown this is important because we get around the saints sometimes and they won't smile or laugh and we act like that's spiritual. 
Like, hallelujah. Like, that's not hallelujah. <laughs> I want to have some fun on the way to heaven. I'm talking about clean fun. Can I have an amen? I'm talking about clean fun. I'm not talking about ungodly fun. I'm talking about clean fun, but I want to have some fun. I want to laugh all the way into the kingdom of God, and I want God to have pleasure in me. Can I have an amen? We should be having a good time. People won't even laugh. That's not holy. Like, that's not holy. What are you talking about? The Bible says that he sits in the heavens and he laughs. We got to realize that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Can I have an amen? The joy of the Lord is your strength. When God begins to release a joy in your life, unspeakable and full of glory, it just begins to consume you. Some people are always, always mad. Always angry at somebody. Nothing is ever perfect. Nothing is ever right. Nothing is, and I, I want this, and I got to have this. You didn't do it. And it's like, listen, man, can you just sit down and laugh sometime? You know, I love to laugh at myself. Like, man, you crazy, dude. I'm, I'm, I watch the, I watch the, sometimes I go back and watch these videos, and I'm sitting there, and I say, man, you, brother, man, you wild, man. Last week, I'm just making up words. <laughs> Praise the Lord, anyhow. <laughs> Can I have an amen? I mean, it's like we take ourselves so seriously that we don't take, take time to realize that it's your maker who's making you. You rejoice, and, and we allow the joy of the Lord, the joy of our king, to be front and center within our, within our church, that, that the king of God, the king of glory, and our mighty God is in our midst. We reverence him, we, we, we honor him, but we also enjoy him. And the joy of the Lord becomes our strength, and God begins to change us when we take pleasure in who he is, and then take pleasure in what he's doing in our lives. Everything's not perfect yet, but you're on the potter's wheel. He is perfecting you, and we learn how to rejoice over those things. Stop being so angry and mad and bitter and resentful and have hate. Yeah. We can't live like that, saints. We can't live like that. We can say tough things to people with a smile on our face. Like, I'm about to fire you. <laughs> Saints, we got, we got to get, we got to get ourselves in because this is, we start to take joy in our king. Because, now watch this, y'all. Because what the devil will do Look at your life. Look at all this stuff. Man, God's letting you down. You know, the Lord's not coming back for you. You know, he doesn't care about you. Look, you're here all by yourself. You know, and the, the, devil's, the devil's goal is to create seeds of doubt. Doubt, which brings forth discouragement. And then, then the next thing you know, people start questioning, questioning questioning and then questioning the relationship with God and then what happens is you find yourself going down this road and you look up and you say man I've just drifted away from God because you didn't find any joy in him we want to find our joy let the children of Zion be joyful in their king rejoice in their maker let them praise his name with the dance I love it Revival fires begin to spring forth when we begin to praise God. We worship God. We honor God. We rejoice in him as our, as our maker. And it just becomes a part of the culture of our church and what we're doing here. There's a freshness about what God does, inspiring us to sing new songs. And then we begin to praise him, and we do it with joy and rejoicing. And saints, and then we start dancing a little bit. God starts moving your feet, you know. 
He starts moving your feet. Your body just, you start getting in there, and then the Spirit of God starts moving. And then all of a sudden, your feet just, you know, you just start to get the little, a little twitchy there. You know what I'm saying? And then you just, and the, you don't cabbage patch like you used to. You don't w- watusi like you used to. You don't, don't go there. But there's, a, but there's a new dance God started. It's a holy dance that God started. Can I have an amen? God started putting a holy dance in your spirit, and then, the, and then it just starts to, it starts to kick in, and we start to praise him and worship him with the dance. You know, we can't come to church, saints, and it's like a morgue up in here. Dead saints. It's amazing. We put dead saints on the walls at some churches. Wow. But what happens is, is this. we got to get out of the dead saints mentality. We got to come into something fresh because God will put a dance in your spirit and you just got to, man, God is a good God. Yes, he is. I say God is a good God. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Come here. It just comes out of your spirit. <laughs> Can I have an amen? It makes you want to dance. It makes you want to dance because God is good. But we, what we've done is we, we stifle. We stifle the move of God and the joy of God. And then we put a time limit on how much, how much time we have even to praise God. Brother, you have 15 minutes. And then that's over. We have to move on with the program. It's like, wait a minute. What if the Lord don't show up in 15 minutes? Can I have an amen? Amen. What if he don't show up? What if the presence of God doesn't fill this place in 15 minutes? What are we supposed to do? We got to wait on the Lord and praise him until the glory cloud. Can I have an amen? Until the glory cloud begins to fill this place and we feel the anointing and God's presence is here and he's saturating the building from the front to the back and that God, we feel your presence and now we can move on because our king is in the, our king is in the building. Oh, oh, I love it. So what happens is, is that we learn how to rejoice in our king. Look, and we praise him with the dance. He says not only the dance, he says let them sing praises uh, to him with the timbrel. That's the tambourine. The tambourine. We want instruments. He says the harp. We use instruments. Saints, our church needs to be loud sometimes. Needs to be loud. You know how you go to a sporting event? It gets loud in there. Now, it wasn't too loud on Wednesday night when the Warriors lost and their fans started leaving early. I know it got a little quiet then. See, I lost my saints. I lost my saints. Where y'all go? Where y'all go? Come on, let's rejoice. (laughs) I got y'all with that one. I know I got Kenyon real good with that one. But see, what happens is the church should be loud. We're, 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 God is spectacular. We rejoice and we shout. And so if you want to go to a quiet church, this isn't the one. Now, it does get quiet. We do get quiet. We do get quiet. There's a place for quiet and meditation, holy meditation. We do that. And we praise God for that. But there's times in service where it needs to get loud. Because, saints, we're, we're praising God the king of the universe. And we're here to worship his name. And we do it with the timbrel and the harp and and with the tambourine and the harp and and we do it with the keyboards and with the drums. We do it and it's loud. And Pastor Kaufman, it's loud. Yes, it's loud. Get loud. If you get loud, you won't hear it. (laughs) 
you get loud. We shout and we praise and we dance and we glorify because we're free in this place. Devil, the devil has been loosed from us and the power of God has come upon us and God has given us an opportunity to experience redemption and salvation and healing. And God has brought forth his mighty hand. So we have to, we got to continue to push back and continue just to acknowledge the greatness of God in our life. And sometimes it's going to get loud. And you say, thank God, it's loud in here. I'm going to begin to shout in this place because God has been good to me. And he has been faithful. And I'm going to give him the glory. The devil wants me to shut up and go in the closet and just shut my mouth. But I will not. Son of David, have mercy upon me. Son of David, have mercy upon me. Son of David, have mercy upon me. This is what happens. We dance. We use the instrument that God has given us. He says, for the Lord, now look at verse four, y'all. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. And he will beautify the humble, he says, with what? With salvation. I love this. So when we stop to think about all of our wretchedness, Jesus comes in and saves us and gives us a new and fresh opportunity in life that we might be born again. Saints, we stop and then we start to acknowledge that God, he takes pleasure in me. He takes pleasure in me. This word pleasure in the Hebrew, it means to delight in someone. That God, you delight in me. I'm being perfected, I'm not there yet, but God, you delight in me. I fell down, bumped my head, I got up, but you take pleasure in me. God, I, I, I know that I'm still, I'm, but God's not, he didn't choose you because you were perfect, he chose you so that he could perfect you. Can I have an amen? And so I, well, the more and more I realize that and I start to see that God, you take delight in me. I want you to stay delighted in me. I want to make sure that I walk in this delightment. I want, I want God to continue just to do this in my life. I want to experience that delight, that God, not only that, but you beautify the humble with salvation. That Hebrew word there also means the meek. So prideful people, they don't get God's beauty working in their life. Angry and resentful people that have hatred and bitterness towards God and towards people. They don't receive the beautification process. But God wants to beautify the humble or meek people and what we, with his salvation. And this is what he does. He begins to give you beauty for your ashes. He begins to take that and then he starts to change you from the inside. He changes you from the inside. He begins to beautify you from within, but then he does it also from without. And when you go back, saints, I dare you to go back and look at some pictures from 20 years ago when you wasn't walking with the Lord. And then look at pictures of you now. Now, you may have lost some hair, but, but, but look at the glory on you, though. Can I have an amen? Amen. You may not be the same size, but the glory of God is on you, and you'll be able to see it. Like, man, I remember what I used to be doing during that time in that picture, and to see what God is doing in my life now, and then the glory of God that's upon my life. He beautifies the humble with salvation. Salvation is a beautification process. He begins to change you. And people look and say, man, that guy is always happy. Why does he almost have, always have some joy? What's up with this person? Why is she always smiling? She's just always smiling. Always smiling and so nice and happy all the time. Get around Diane Williamson. Williamson, you get around her. She just, hey, Pastor, how you doing? Where, is she here today? Where's Sister Diane? Where's she at? She's where? She's translating back there. But she's just always so happy. So Diane, Diane, when you're translating back there, I'm translating about you. <laughs> translating. Now listen, 
He will beautify the humble with salvation. He says, let the saints be joyful in glory. Look at verse five. Let them sing aloud on their beds. What is your house like? What's your home like? What kind of atmosphere are you creating in your house? What kind of atmosphere have you created and cultivated in your house? Is there singing aloud on your bed? Is praise in your house? Do people come in and they feel, wow, it's just peaceful in here. Spirit of God is in here. Or do all the people you invite over, they want to leave quick? <laughs> Saints, you want, you want your atmosphere because you've cultivated after people walk in your house and they just feel the presence of God. That's your, that's your sanctuary. That's, God has created that for He says sing aloud on their bed. There's something beautiful about that. It's at your home that it's a place where the Spirit of God is welcome. He's present in your place. You want to see that, that you're not the only one living there. That you're entertaining someone always and that the angels are there too. You want them to say, let's go to his house. <laughs> angels, I mean, Lord, send us on assignment to their house. That, that it's nice over there. We not fighting demons all night. <laughs> Come on, give the angels a break, y'all. <laughs> we want to create an atmosphere that brings forth because we're singing aloud on our bed. Look what he says here. He says, let, verse 6, the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword, he says, in their hand. This is where the shift takes place. He says to to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment in, on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment, this honor have all the saints. He says, praise ye the Lord. Part of this is millennial reign talk, but part of it is what transpires right now during this particular period of time in, in church history we realize that, that though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. And so we're not talking about just here from a nation standpoint, just the literal nations, but also we have to see that, like I said, some of this is prophetic, which God will do during the millennial reign, but also realize that right now there is a nation that is fighting against the, the kingdom, let me show you this. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Because as worshipers and as a people that are seeking to see God continue to release the revival fires, this aspect, this aspect of praise and worship, like I stated in the beginning, has to be clearly understood. We want to be worshipers, but we have to be warriors. It says in verse 3, it says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or natural, he says, but mighty in God for pulling down, he says, strongholds. So realize that, that when, when the writer of, of Psalm 149 is writing, like I said, there's a, there's a natural aspect to that that will be fulfilled during the millennial reign, but we have to see that from a spiritual standpoint, this dynamic of warfare is taking place all the time. And we want to bind, we want to rebuke, and we want to set things in order, and, but we do it not according to the flesh. So we have to stop hating people. Realizing that there is a sp spiritual host of wickedness that we're fighting on a day-to-day -day basis and our praise is a weapon to push them back. And so what we want to do is make sure that we're clear that the weapons of our warfare are not 
carnal. He says, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments or imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is what, y'all, fulfilled. And so we, we have to realize that primarily the battle that we're going to fight takes place right here in our mind. And we have to cast down imagination so that we don't create strongholds in our minds erected upon lies that the devil tells us all the time. The devil is a liar, and he is a father of lies. And one of the things that God gives us, he gives us a means to push back the enemy, and our praise and worship is such a powerful force. When he starts lying to you, start praising God. When he starts telling you who you're not, you start praising God. When he starts telling you you're not going to make it, you start praising God. You don't get it. When, the, when you're coming to the work and everybody on your job is against you, you just continue to give God glory. You just continue to praise God. If family members reject you, you praise God. When kids abandon you, you praise God. When the man walks out, you praise God. When the woman walks out, you praise God. You continue to praise God, and what happens? It pushes back the works of the enemy, and then the lie in your mind doesn't get erect. Can I? have an amen the lie in your mind doesn't get erected and then now you don't have a stronghold in your mind because you're casting down imaginations and arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God I believe what God says rather than what you say devil and you learn how to fight like that and yet it's not and it's something that you have to do on a day-to-day basis God will take us into seasons where, just like with Jesus, he was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights. And we see that after Jesus resisted him, he left him for a season. God will give you great seasons where the devil is not bothering you. But sometimes you just sense the devil, he's just right there. He's trying to get me, but it's not going to work. He's trying to get me to go back, but I'm not going to give in. He's going to try to get me to do it. I won't do it. The devil, you're lying. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going back. The bad old Napoleon Kaufman is dead. You can't have You can't have my life no more. Can I have an amen? You start telling the devil that I know what you're trying to do, but it's not going to work. And matter of fact, put the praise music on. Let's go on to worship. Devil, you can stay if you want to, but I'm getting ready to get my praise on right now up in here. Up in here. Can I have an amen? Hey, roll up your car windows and start having a church party right there on the side of the freeway if you have to. Woo! God is good. And I love it. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. You can't win, beat the enemy by using natural means. You got to understand your spiritual weapons. I'm going to show you here. But you got to understand your spiritual weapons. And praise is one of your greatest weapons. Stop being carnal. Stop arguing with people at the grocery store. Just praise God and keep it pushing. Can I have an amen? You take the thoughts and you capture them and you bring them into obedience to Christ. Don't let the thoughts just linger on in your head. You you take them captive. Like That's a lie. That's the devil. And you take it captive and then you begin to get your mind on the knowledge of God. Start to quote out of your mouth. If you start to read, start to sing, and begin to tell the devil that you're lying, but I'm going to praise God. And then as you praise God, then what happens? He begins to, he has to lift. He has to lift. He has to lift. Now, let me say this, saints. God will always make a way of escape. You got to take it. Look at this. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to close it out with this. Ephesians chapter 6. And this is the dynamic that we're dealing with. Because we're going to praise God. We're going to worship God. But we're going to do it realizing that our worship, it blesses God 
it blesses him, but it also is a weapon against our enemy. He says in verse 10, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He says, put on the whole armor of God. He says that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So when we read Psalm 149, you see he starts talking about praise, but then he starts to go right into the judgment. He starts going into warfare. He says, you gotta, he says that the praises of God, he said, in a two-edged sword in your hand. Well, for us, we realize this dynamic the same way David was a worshiper. He, he was also a warrior. He had a kingdom to defend, and he had to fight. Well, it's the same thing for us. We have a great God that we serve, and we praise him, but we never forget that we do have an adversary, and one of our weapons to rebuke him is our praise and our worship. He said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the systematic forms of attack. He says, um, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against a spiritual host of wickedness, he says, in the heavenly places. We got a fight on our hands, y'all. But we know what our praise does. He says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, he says, stand therefore. Stand therefore. Don't, don't back down. Saints, stop backing down to the devil. You let these demons know, you let the devil know, no matter who those devils are coming through, you let people know, I'm going to bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, I'm going to exalt the Lord, and I'm going to rejoice and, and glorify his name. We're, this is What happens is you start to get this in your spirit. And, what, and people get around you and they get confused because you just keep praising God no matter what. And like I said earlier, saints, it bothers the enemy that you will serve God no matter what. So you stand there for. We make sure that it's clear, I'm not going anywhere, devil. You got to go. You're not pushing me off God's purpose in my life. You're not going to get me to quit. You're not going to get me to throw in the towel. You're not going to get me to forsake God. You're not going to get me to go back to my old lifestyle. You're not going to do it because, the, because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That God is on my side. And I'm not going anywhere until God says, it's to, can I have an amen? I'm not going anywhere until God says, it's time for, oh, I'm about to walk the floor up in here. I'm feeling it. I just started get, getting, I start, I'm starting to feel it. Because what happens is we get in this book and we begin to praise God and worship God. He says, stand there for having girded your waist with the truth he says having put on the breastplate of righteousness he says having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace and above all take the shield of what he says of faith he says, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. When the enemy tries to come in and shoot darts in your mind, you just lift up your face shield and say, devil, I will continue to believe God. I will trust God. I will rest in him. I will yield to him. I will give my life to him. That God, I will glorify your name. I will bless you. Can I have an amen, y'all? He said, the wicked one, and look at verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. And he says, the sword of the spirit, which is the what? Well, the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful in the, he says, to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change, that in it I may speak boldly. We talked about that last week. He says, as I ought to speak. 
men and women of God, we are in a time in our culture where the devil wants to muzzle us to silence the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us to get in a position where we allow terror or fear to come upon us so that everybody else is coming out of the closet except us. But I came this morning, come on worship team, come on back up here. I came this morning to serve notice on the devil that we are gonna bless the Lord at all times that we're going to praise and we're going to create a culture within our church where praise and worship becomes such a lifestyle because this is what causes the revival's fires to stay kindled. You cannot stay in revival if you refuse to praise God. You won't see the move of God take place in your life if you refuse to praise God or if you only praise him when something good happens in your life. We are fighting against principalities, against powers, against the wicked rulers of the darkness of this age and a spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. But God has clothed us with an armor that is supernatural. And we have weapons that are not carnal, but they're mighty in God to pulling down strongholds. And what we have to learn how to do is allow God to clothe us. And then we begin to exercise by releasing our praise, our worship, our adoration, and we glorify him. Because saints, when the children the book of Acts, these saints, they saw a reviving take place and it was a move of God, such a powerful move of God. But there was an atmosphere of joy and rejoicing. They had all things common. They, they, they got together, it was a beautiful thing. And you see the word of God was being preached. And the spirit of God was being poured out and it became a part of, and then they took those fires and they began to go all the different places and the cities and and the spirit of God was moving and that's what we want. And you don't have to, you know, do something crazy. It's just the fire is in you and then now you done brought the fire to your job. The fire is in you now. Your family members, they just get around you and there's a fire, there's a fire. Your kids, they see you. What happened to mama? She just got caught on fire. God just caught her on fire. He set her ablaze. Can I have an amen? What happened to my dad, man? He used to be out there and he was tripping. But look at him. He just want to pray. He's trying to seek God. He's trying to go to church. What happened? The spirit of God. Revival fires. Can I have an amen? Can I have an amen? It just starts to spread and it just becomes a part of you. And then people get around you and there's a rejoicing, there's a joy. And then when the devil comes, you're able to clearly acknowledge that I see what you're trying to do. But you can't stop me. You can't stop me. I'm going to praise God. Come on, saints. Let's stand to our feet and just begin to praise him. What's that last song we just sung? He deserves it. Do y'all think he deserves it? Are you ready? Are you ready? My hallelujah belongs to you. Come on, y'all. Come on, now let's sing the song. My hallelujah belongs to you.
Awesome God, y'all. I said, do we serve an awesome God? Something about your praise. Something about your praise. Lord, we love you this morning. Such a privilege to be in your presence. Lord, lead us, guide us by your spirit. And we commit to giving you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, somebody said amen, amen, amen. God bless y'all. Thank you for tuning in. I'll see you next week.